If you travel some around the U.S., you'll notice some differences in how people are from region to region. How fast or how slow they talk. How fast or how slow they walk. Or in some parts of America, if they walk at all, because they don't have to walk, they drive a car wherever they go. If they drive, how fast they drive. How direct or indirect they may be in conversation. How laid back they are or how tightly wound they seem to be. And if you are from that region, you likely don't notice it because it's normal to you. It's only when you go somewhere else that you notice those differences. Of course, in Boston, we're known for being fast moving, fast walking, aggressive driving, driven people. And we say to ourselves, well, of course we are. Why wouldn't you be? Why wouldn't you be busy? Why wouldn't you be busy? Why wouldn't you be sort of wound up? That's how we get so much done. So we in Boston look at people in other parts of the country, in the South and in the West, and we wonder, how do they live in such slow-moving places? Personally, I find myself intrigued by certain areas, particularly in the West, uh, Denver in particular, and San Diego, because of uh, so much sunshine and the lack of humidity. And there are certain times of the year when it's really hot and humid or very cold when I think, I think I might want to move there. But honestly, I don't think I would be happy because my perception, at least, is that people there are just more laid back, slow paced. And I fear, I just don't think I could, I think I'd be too wound up for that. And they would get tired of me very quickly. So I found my place in Boston. The fact is, our fast paced lives allow us to get much done. And we can do much good. But these fast-paced lives can also consume our hearts and our souls, can grind us up, drive us to exhaustion. I wonder if you've ever felt yourself worn down, exhausted by the pace of life, pace of work, study. I know I do at times. So today we want to consider briefly, how are we investing our lives and are we doing so wisely and well? And can we give our lives, the years that we have, to things that really matter? So you have a Bible, turns me to Psalm 127. I encourage you to open up a copy of the Bible, or just open up a Bible app, just so you can see the text in front of you today, just so you can see exactly where I'm drawing these thoughts from. Psalm 127. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil. For he gives to his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. This morning in our passage, I'd like for us to see this emphasis. Trust the Lord who builds fruitful lives. Trust the Lord who builds fruitful lives. Lives. And we'll look at our passage this morning by just asking two questions. First, how can I build my life well? And the second, how can I invest well in family? How can I build my life well? How can I invest well in family? So, first, how can I build my life well in verses one and two? Now God's people at the time of this Psalm's writing had the same challenges that we all face today. The temptation to busy themselves with the construction of, of a life, of a physical home, of the care, the protection of a city. And the idea here of building of a house includes more holistically our life of building a, a, an actual house, but also a life, a family, a vocation. The psalmist here writes of the protection of the city, which was normal in the world of that day. The city had to be mindful of that. So often the constructing of a wall, even around a city, in order to protect it from the attacks of enemies. 
So they easily could have been quite focused on building a house or protecting a city. And friends, here we see the danger of building your life through self-reliance. And we see this caution, verse 1 and 2, unless the Lord builds it, unless the Lord watches. So if we try to build our physical home or the broader life that we may have, a family, on any other resource than God, it's in vain. The self-reliant house is in vain. The very best that I can personally produce, it's not enough. It won't last. The very best friend that you can produce, if it's driven by self-reliance, it won't last. It won't hold up. The same goes with security for our lives, security of a city, security of your family, the security of anything that we have, if it's grounded in resources other than God, it's in vain. Everyone could apply this as well to your education, to your career. If it's grounded only in yourself, in your own efforts, it's ultimately not sufficient. It's a vain pursuit. My friend, I wonder if you ever find yourself struggling with self-reliance. I know that I do. In fact, I very easily bend towards that. It's the natural direction when a difficulty comes for me is to move towards self-reliance. So over the years as a pastor, I've been a pastor for, for 22 years, um, it's always been difficult to take a true day off. That's because there are always tasks, there are always challenges, there are always things to be done, and my default is to think, I can do more, I should do more. There's always a, another day to take off in the midst of that, but fundamentally what I'm doing is I'm living by fear. That's why I don't take a day off. Self-reliance. As if God needs me, when of course he doesn't. He'll do fine if I take a day off. And then I've found again and again, and it'll be a struggle tomorrow, so typically Monday is my day off. It, it will be a struggle tomorrow, to truly disconnect. And so moment by moment, the, rat, the battle rages between self-reliance and reliance on God. And friends, notice the result of our self-reliant living, verse 2, it leads to this vicious cycle of rising early and staying up late. So we rise early because the work must be done, and we're convinced that it all depends on us, and so we work all day, and then we stay up late, and because we have to come through, if we, if we do sleep, it's unsatisfying sleep, sleep that doesn't refresh, and it's often sleepless nights because we stay up so late, or even while we're trying to sleep, our hearts are filled with anxiety. And so we find ourselves either working and studying or worrying while we're working and studying or worrying that we aren't working or studying enough. Some of you, even right now, are thinking... I could be working right now. Or I could be studying right now. Or you're doing it right now. You're actually, you know, doing some math or some calculus right now as we sit. And so we lose sleep. And then we throw ourselves into more self-reliant work. And we work and we work, but we aren't satisfied and we can't find rest. Friend, can you identify with that? The frustration of laying in bed, your mind racing with worry. And when you do sleep, you wake up not rested, but still exhausted. I typically sleep easily and well. To the great frustration of my wife, within seconds, I can just turn over sound asleep. She, she doesn't have that, and so it's difficult for her to sleep. I sleep extraordinarily well, but because I normally sleep easily and well, when I do have a sleepless night, it's like it throws my whole world off. And so this past week, there were a couple of other challenges that came that led to multiple nights of sleeplessness. This led to great exhaustion from that. I wonder if you know that experience. We're cautioned that we should, shouldn't be satisfied to eat the bread of this anxious labor in verse 2. 
So we have this choice. Will we work and eat anxiously and nervously? But notice we do receive some bread. He doesn't say you won't receive any bread, that there won't be any bread that results. But it is a bread that won't truly satisfy. Unfortunately, the dangerous part is that this bread may convince us we're actually making real progress. And yet this is a treadmill that we can never get off. It's a trap. Self-reliant work is so dangerous because it can bring progress for a time. The fruit, the result of long hours and worry may appear to be substantial for a while. So we worry and we work hard and we make apparent progress and it looks like we're getting ahead. And self-reliance is doubly dangerous and tempting in our culture because it looks so respectable. For if you live like this, working, anxiously staying awake, forsaking sleep, you can accumulate accomplishments, degrees, you can climb the ladder of success. You will, in fact, get lots of affirmation for living like this. For if you rise early and stay up late and self-reliant work, you will more likely be applauded. It will never get you fired. It will more than likely get you promoted. They'll say, this is the sort of person we want. She's never off. All she does is work. Promote her all the more. It will not initially lessen your success as a student. It may, in fact, get you ahead. And almost no one in our city or on your campus will caution you against this. But if we live like this, we'll fit in well in Boston. I mean, this is the heartbeat of life in Boston. Now, is the psalmist, is God against hard work? Is he calling us to, to, to a life of just sort of ease and even laziness? No. For God himself created work. We see work in the world before sin enters in. So work is from God. It is a good and right thing. Now, as a result of the fall, work did become more difficult. And work can easily become toil. But friend, it is good and God-glorifying for his people to work, and sometimes to even work very hard. And much good can be done through your work. There are certainly times in one's life that may involve rising early, even going to bed late for a season. You might be in a degree program where obviously nearing finals, you, you will have to work more. The beginning of a particular job, so we don't want to miss here what the scriptures are saying. In fact, Christians, since we're working for the glory of God, we should be hard workers. We should be diligent. I mean, in fact, our employers or our professors should think, I don't know why they do it, but I would like to have more Christian employees. I'd like to have more Christian students because they're just disciplined, they're diligent, they're honest. They're not frantic, but they do work hard. So God doesn't say to us, don't get up early for work. He doesn't say, don't stay up late for work. But he does give us this significant principle. Don't rise up early or stay up late out of nervousness, anxiety, out of self-reliance. So our text holds out a caution of the danger of self-reliant work. But he also holds out the potential of a transformed outlook. For we should see the potential of work and rest that relies on God and that isn't self-reliant. This psalm is both a, a, a daunting caution, but also a hopeful promise of what can be. There's good news here for the ones called the beloved. Those who are loved by God. So who are the beloved of God? It is those who trust in him. This is an identity. This is not what we do. It's not something that we earn, but it is who we are. 
So friend, this is glorious good news that you could be called, that we could be called those who are loved by God, the beloved of God. How did God bring us in as his beloved? For this we celebrate at Easter in the days that are to come. Through the coming forth of Jesus Christ, the son who came and lived a perfect sinless life, through his purposeful sacrificial death, his triumphant resurrection, through that he provided a way for sinners and rebels like you and I to be brought in as children of God. To be loved by God. 1 John 3 1 says it this way See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God, and so we are. So, friend, if you're a Christian, this is who you are most fundamentally a beloved child of God, one of the beloved of God. And friend, if you're here today and you're not a Christian, we're so grateful you would spend part of your Sunday here with us. And the scriptures paint a realistic picture of humans, that we can't do much good on our own by God's common grace, that we all have value as image bearers of God, and yet we all have gone our own way. We've rebelled against God. But the good news is there is a God who can be known, who has pursued us through the coming of Jesus Christ to provide this salvation, but it is salvation that is not worked for. It is not earned. In fact, it must not be. It can only be received as a gift by faith. And so friend, if this is new to you, this church would love for you to know this. So if you came with a friend or a classmate and they're a Christian, they would love to tell you more. We're following the service. Brother Larry, he'll be here. He would love to chat. I'll, I'll be here today. I'd love to chat with you as well. And friends, for those of you who are Christian, this is who you are, loved of God. And if you think in light of that, it really can change the way that we live. So friend, we want to consider, whose approval are you seeking that drives you to embrace such self-reliant living? Whose love and appreciation perhaps are you running after in your labors? Whose applause do you most desire? Because the good news is that in Christ you have received the perfect approval and love of God. And that can potentially free us if we understand that and we believe that and we live in light of that. That we don't have to be captive to the applause or the lack thereof of others. So we see in the text that God gives to his beloved, verse 2. God gives. It's the very nature of our God. He is the giver. The God of grace who pours out his gifts, the ultimate gift in Christ, and still gives to us gift upon gift, day after day, to each of us. And what do we, does he give to his beloved? Look at verse 2. It says, for he gives to his beloved sleep. He gives rest, refreshment. So one of the things that God gives to his children is this restful, restoring sleep which is an interesting gift. What must we do? Humbly receive this gift. It takes humility and trust in God to set aside what needs to be done, to understand deadlines that are coming, but to choose to close your eyes and go to sleep. And friend, God made us as people with bodies that need sleep. Our bodies require sleep, which should be a daily reminder to us that would humble us how weak we are, that we need sleep. It's a good gift that we need this rhythm. I understand that some people really struggle with sleep. And friends, so I want you to understand, this is not a promise where you should feel guilty 
if sleep really is difficult for you. So I don't want to add a burden on top of the already great difficulty of sleep. But sometimes, one of the realities is, in this fallen world, there are any number of struggles we face. And so one of those, unfortunately, for many of you may be, that your body just doesn't sleep well. So friend, this is not a, a promise that somehow you are, are failing if you're not sleeping. But we do want to see this good gift that God gives, received as we're able of sleep. When we look at the translation here at the end of verse 2, there's an interesting way that this text can be translated one of a couple of different ways that are equally good. He certainly says he gives to his beloved sleep. That's an accurate representation. But it can also be translated reliable. He, he gives to his beloved even in his sleep. And certainly whether this verse says that it's true in scripture that God gives to us while we sleep. So at the very least, God gives sleep. But likely also, God grants us rest. But not only that, while we rest, friend, while you sleep, God works on your behalf. You're asleep, not working. He is working. And friend, our God can accomplish more, much more, infinitely more while you sleep than you can while you're awake. And friends, that's good news. I mean, think of the farmer. Every farmer, let's say this person is farming wheat, they work all day. Farmers work very hard. But eventually the farmer must go to bed, must go to sleep. And though all day he, he may be pulling the weeds, he may be watering, he may be fertilizing, he can do much to encourage growth. But fundamentally, while he sleeps for eight hours, more growth will come from the wheat than he can cause all day. For God is the one who causes the growth. And friends, so it is in your life, in the various struggles in our world, there is much that we can do. There's good that we can do, but we also lay down our heads, we go to sleep trusting God is at work. In those relationships in your life, you're trying to help someone bear burden, appropriately so, praying for and with them. Friends, still lay your head down and go to sleep and trust that God is at work. Now, friend, consider the, the hope on the other side of the cautions here. So the caution is, unless the Lord builds it, the builders labor in vain. But the flip side would be this. If the Lord builds it, the builder isn't laboring in vain. The caution is, unless the Lord watches, the watchman labors in vain. But the flip side would be, if the Lord does guard, then the watchman doesn't stay awake in vain. So friend, there is a way that as we work with the strength that God gives us, that he works through our work and the Lord builds. Friend, he can empower your work, empower your study. He will give you rest. And he will work while you rest. So what would it look like to have a different view of work and of study of our labors in this world? And let's pray that God would enable us to feel the weight of, of this caution that he gives. And let's wear appropriate repent of self-reliant living. This might be a good thing to consider today. Think, yeah, honestly, this semester, yeah, I think I've been working from self-reliance. I've been captive to the approval of others. We might pray that God would help us to discern our own hearts. You might ask yourself this week some questions like, why do I stay up late? Why, why do I rise early? What's driving me to work so hard and so long? Is it fear? Insecurity? Pride? Pride? Seeking the approval of others. Friend, you might consider, who could help you on this? It might be a wise thing to ask a trusted brother or sister to say, I admit, I, I'm tempted to live in a self-reliant way, to burn myself out. So I'm giving you permission. In fact, I'm asking you, would you periodically ask me some questions about how I'm doing in this area? Friend, also consider how if we live differently, 
this is one of the many ways you can be a light in this city. Think about in your workplace or on your campus, how distinctive it would be if you worked hard and with excellence, but you knew when to stop. You weren't always exhausted. You had some leisure in your life. You weren't always frazzled. In a frazzled, overworking city, it's a, a chance to be distinctive. Now, we don't as Christians say, I'm just not going to study. I'm going to be relaxed all the time. That, that's not the call here. We, we would not glorify God to be just super rested, but you never do your assignments. That's not. But what if you did work hard and work well and we're not overwhelmed? But would not our coworkers or fellow students say, how does she live that way? How was he able to do that? Maybe one last application from this this morning would be this. Maybe today, receive sleep from God today. Here's my suggestion. Go home this afternoon and take a nap. I'm going to do that. That's going to be my, my application this, this afternoon. I will be napping. So you might just go home and tell your roommate or tell your family, like... Preacher said, yeah, I got to take a nap today. That might be a wise step for many of us. Even if, or maybe especially if, there is much to be done. Say, I need rest. So we see how we can build our lives well. And then second and more briefly, how can I invest well in the family? My friend, if you don't have family, if you're not married, if you don't have children, you're going to be tempted to tune me out. But please hang with me because there's something here for all of us. We see this in verses 3 through 5. The psalmist tells us that the children are a heritage, a reward. They're a heritage from the Lord. They're an inheritance given by God. They are a gift from God. So friend, all children are a gift from God. And he also uses the image here that they are a reward. They are a gift uh, but, but this is not saying that children are earned. That's not the sense of this. It's not saying that if you are good enough, you will earn children, or that if somehow you desire children and you have not received them, somehow you have not done enough to earn them. That's not what this text is saying. But it is saying that for those who have children, friends, we must see them as a gift. So if you're a parent, do you see your children as a gift from God? An undeserved gift that God has entrusted to you? Or do you find yourself perhaps more often thinking of them as something, someone, or someones who only take from you? They take your sleep. They take your energy. They eventually take your money. All those things. I mean, do you only think of them as what they take from you? Children are a gift from God. It is costly to parent. It is exhausting to parent. Friends, what a beautiful gift they are. So as individuals, as families, and then as a church, you want to be a church that values children. And children are to be strategic like arrows. Look at verse 4 and 5. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. So God intends for children to be like a well-honed weapon, like an arrow in the hand of an expert warrior that can accomplish purposes. So the psalmist says, parents, children are like that. They are to be invested in, equipped, prepared, and then sent out into the world to do significant good. And what is the good that we might send our children out in the world to do most of all to glorify God in whatever they do? be devoted followers of Jesus and join in his mission. Friends, that is the goal as parenting. It's not primarily can we train our child up to get into this university or that. It's not primarily that our children would grow up and become ultra successful for our own reputation. But it is that, Lord willing, they would glorify God and they would join in his mission. 
So parents, if you have children, God has entrusted children to you. They are a gift and they are to be stewarded well. And in order for them to be sent out in the world one day as a well-directed arrow, it will take time and intentionality. It will require sacrifice. Children will not just naturally grow up to be a well-directed, God-glorifying arrow. So we must be wise and intentional. Parents, your parenting needs to be strategic and persevering. So you want to think about, plan for how do we invest in our children. And if we don't intentionally think about it, it just won't happen. Life is busy. So much grabs our time and attention. So parents, we must engage with our children and also want to see them engaged in faith. So parents, do, you, do your children see you loving Jesus and loving the things of Jesus? Do they see you loving his church, engaged with the scriptures? I know life is busy, particularly when you have younger children, but it doesn't get better. It's always busy. And so parents, what shapes the calendar of your family? Is it, is it you or is it your child? It's easier for me to say here, not to my own congregation. I do say it there, but, but it's a little bit of a touchy subject. When kids are young, we want them to sleep. And we want them to sleep also so that we can sleep. I understand that. It's exhausting when children don't sleep. But sometimes parents of young children begin to, to schedule our entire life around our child's rhythms, which pull us out of community, honestly. We're not able to do anything with other people. We're not able to engage in a, a small group from the church. And friends, rhythm is good and it's wise, and we do want your kids to sleep, but I don't think you're helping yourself to pull out of community. And we're also subtly teaching our children something that's actually unhelpful. Because we're teaching our children that they're the guiding center of our family. That our life revolves around them. Instead of saying to them, our family loves the church. So sometimes that means a late Sunday night with another family from the church. Sometimes that means a small group at the church. And so, yeah, sleep's bumpy for a day or two after that. But that's the nature of what our family is. So parents, just let me encourage you in that to be wise. And as they get older, you'll face the challenge of are the Sunday morning gatherings optional in your family or not? Because there's a stunning number of opportunities for kids that are only on Sunday morning. But friend, you want to grow your children in love for the local church and prepare them for a time where they'll make their own decisions about that as well. And friends, for those of you who are single parents, seeking to do all of this on your own, it's a tremendously challenging thing that you do, but what a beautiful picture you are displaying. I encourage you, let the church serve you in this endeavor. Now, parents, please hear this. Doing this does not guarantee that your child will ultimately put their faith in Christ. But it certainly increases the likelihood of it. Friends, see that investing in children is a worthwhile, eternal investment. Now, are we sufficient for the task on our own? No. But God will empower you for this. As we think about this, we also need to keep in mind that God transforms our outlook on the family by, in the New Testament, broadening the scope of the family. In Matthew 12, we see a time when Jesus was teaching his mother, and Mary, and his brothers came to him. And the people told him that your, your family is here. And Jesus said this, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hands to his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Because Jesus makes clear that in Christ, all who trust in Christ are part of this new family. Not replacing your biological family, if you have one, but it is a, a spiritual family that is even closer often than that. In the Old Testament, God's people were told to be fruitful and multiply. The way that you grew the people of God was through literally having children. That was the way that Israel grew. Multiplication. The call is the same in the New Testament. Be fruitful and multiply. But the way that it's told us then is 
go and make disciples of all the nations. Same call. But God's people now does not grow through biological birth, and not through the literal birth of, but is the rebirth of salvation. So therefore, how does this family of God grow? We go and we tell people the good news of Jesus. We make disciples. That's how multiplication happens now. So friend, therefore, this family picture, whether you ever are married or ever have children all, friends, all of us are brought into this. For every one of us play a part in this being fruitful and multiplying as we make disciples. There's valuable, fruitful family work in the family of God for every single Christian. So friend, wherever you are, if you're a believer in Jesus, there are others who you can come alongside of and walk together in helping them grow. There's some that are, maybe you're just a step or two, you've been a Christian just a tiny bit longer. You can bring them a little ways along. And across the next year, the next 10 years, the next 30 years of life, friend, you can play a part in helping to make disciples. And as we do that, we're doing this, this sending out of arrows. And friend, as a church, your church is like ours. Many people will be here a time and will scatter. I talked to multiple people, even this morning, who are moving elsewhere soon. And friend, as a local church, it is painful, isn't it? To know people to love people, and then for them to move away. Now, clearly, they're sinning by leaving. We know that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's tempting for us to tell them that, but of course they're not. We're, they're, they're being sent out. But friend, you see in the family of God, we're, we're sending them out as arrows from Ruggles Baptist Church. So who knows how many arrows across the decades have gone out from Ruggles Baptist Church. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. And friends, that's what we do today. Some who this year will go out from Ruggles Baptist Church will be arrows sent out from this family to go and do good wherever they go. Friends, it is hard to stay. It's exhausting if you've been here to say goodbye. But friends, it's a worthwhile thing. It's a beautiful thing. And the influence of Ruggles Baptist Church is greater because of those arrows going out. That's what you do. So friend, no matter where you are in life, do you see you play a part in this? And for the children who are part of Ruggles Baptist Church, for those of you who are not those children's parents, do you see you have a role in their life? Parents certainly have a role, a responsibility, but parents, just by the nature of being parents, their kids immediately think your parents are not cool and they have limited knowledge. That's what kids think about their parents. And by the fact that you're not their parents, you are immediately cooler than their parents are. And they're watching you. And if they see you love Jesus, and they see you love them, it will play a huge part in their lives. Our kids are now 24 and 21. And so we see in them at times things that we didn't do so well, but they do better already. Or things that we didn't impart to them. We wonder, well, where did they pick that up? And you know where they learned so much of their life is from our church family. People who were at our church and often who moved away as they were sent out like arrows who impacted our kids. Helped our kids love Jesus and love the church. And these are people who are not a part of our biological family, but are a part of the spiritual family of God. Friends, don't discount the role you have on children and teenagers in your church. You can make a massive impact in their lives. So friends, the question for all of us is, will we give our days to helping in the family of God in the local church? Encouraging one another, making disciples, sharing the good news. It's costly to do this. It's time consuming, but friends, it's, it is worthwhile and what a beautiful kingdom investment it is. So friends, let's spend our days well. Not in exhausted self-reliance, but in diligent, passionate, costly God-glorifying, God-trusting kingdom efforts. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for your grace. Lord, I'm grateful for this congregation. 
for how many who've come through this church across the decades and will in the decades to come and be sent out to the world. Lord, help us today to give some evaluation to our lives. Are we eating the bread of anxious toil? Are we resisting the gift of sleep? Lord, help us that we might be distinctive for the spread of your good news and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.